Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg and I am here today because the New York Times Book Review announced its top 10 books of 2022. Now, really quickly, there are two major literary events that I really look forward to every year. The first one is, of course, the announcement of the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. If you follow along, you know I am sort of obsessed with that prize in particular, and I am currently working on a project where I am reading every book that has won the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. Just going through them and make, doing a whole thing <laughs> about them. The other thing I really look forward to every year is the New York Times Book Review's Top 10 Books of the Year. I don't know quite why I ended up fixating on this list. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that when I first started working at Borders way back in the day, I was working at a store in northern New Jersey, and obviously that's in the New York City area, so people really paid attention to the New York Times, and in particular the New York Times book review. So we really had to pay attention to what was on the cover of the book review, and when they announced their top 10 books, we needed to try to quickly order them and make sure we had all of them in stock. So it's something that I learned to really pay attention to and watch for every year. And then when I stopped working at Borders and moved on into other things, that sense of anticipation just kind of stayed and it became like a fun thing to do. And then there was one holiday season when I worked at Barnes & Noble where we actually tried to predict the books that would be on the New York Times top 10. And I think that's actually where the obsession really cemented for me. And I actually won the pool. <laughs> uh, so basically you would pay like $5 to enter and whoever got the most would get all of the money that went into that. And that I, it was me. I think I got six books that year. I didn't do so well with my predictions this year. I did a video talking about the New York Times 100 notable books of 2022. I'll have that in the description box down below. And I tried to pull from there because usually the best books of the year are on the 100 Notable, and I tried to make some guesses about what the five fiction books would be, what the five nonfiction books would be, and I got four. That's not bad. It's not my best, but it's not bad. And I'm kind of pleased about the ones that I did get. We'll talk a little bit about that later. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to run through the books that have been chosen as the New York Times' is. Uh, 10 best books. I'm going to read the little blurb that they attached to each book. I'm going to have a link to the article about this down below. If you would like to check out more details about each book, feel free to do that. Just a disclaimer, because sometimes people will watch these videos and leave a snarky comment about how I shouldn't review books if I have not read them. I am not pretending to have read the, the books that I have not read. If I've read a book, I will tell you. And I'm, these are not reviews. These are the blurbs that they provide. And usually I just kind of respond with whether or not I'm interested in reading the book. That is not a review. So just a quick disclaimer for anybody who might get the wrong impression somehow about what I'm trying to do here. I'm trying to treat this list as a tool of discovery, um, maybe discover some books that I would like to add to my reading list. And some of these books I've been following throughout the year and I'm kind of familiar with. So just commenting on whether or not I would want to read them. These are not reviews if I have not read the book. I'm also going to link the video of the live stream where the New York Times did the announcement because they posted that online after the announcement was made. It is a very interesting thing to watch. Obviously, they spend a lot of time talking a little more in depth about all 10 of the books that have been chosen, but they also open by talking about the process of creating this list, which is fascinating. Uh, they start in January. And it all starts with the Google Doc, which I thought was really interesting. They create a Google Doc, and all of the people who work at the book review will add titles that they read that they like. And then throughout the year, at first they'll have monthly meetings, and then they'll have weekly meetings. They will discuss the books. Other people will read the ones that they want to, people want to make a case for. And by September, they'll start the process of winnowing that list down and actually voting on what the books will be. It's an interesting process. They also talk about some books that did not make the list and that some of the people who were involved in the voting were passionate about. This is where you'll find out like Cormac McCarthy. They are going to release more of those, but uh, it's interesting to hear what some people wanted to make a case for and what, that did not make the list. So all of that will be in the live stream video down below 
if you want to check that out. It's an hour, but they have about eight minutes of dead air in the beginning where they're kind of waiting for the program to start. And you can skip around as you see fit. I think it's fascinating. So if you want to check it out, do it. And we're going to start with the fiction list. The titles are listed alphabetically. And that means that the first book on the list is The Candy House by Jennifer Egan. This is a sort of quasi sequel to A Visit from the Goon Squad. Let's see what they say about it. You don't need to have read Egan's Pulitzer winning A Visit from the Goon Squad to jump feet first into this much anticipated sequel. But for lovers of the 2010 books, prematurely nostalgic New Yorkers, cerebral beauty and laser sharp take on modernity, the candy house is like coming home, albeit to dystopia. This time around, Egan's characters are variously the creators and prisoners of a universe in which, through the wonders of technology, people can access their entire memory banks and use the contents as social media currency. The result is a glorious, hideous funhouse that feels more familiar than sci-fi, all rendered with Egan's signature inventive confidence and, perhaps most impressive of all, heart. The Candy House is of its moment with all that implies. What's going to be interesting about The Candy House is seeing how it stands up as we move away from this moment. Like, yes, it does sound like something that is very much of its moment with all that that implies, as they say. But it will be interesting to see how relevant it remains, if at all, as we move away from it. I think A Visit from the Goon Squad is going to be an interesting book for me to reread next year as part of my Pulitzer Prize project. And when I do that, I do want to read The Candy House. I have not done it yet. I think doing a reread of A Visit from the Goon Squad and reading The Candy House together would be an interesting way of approaching a Pulitzer Prize deep dive for me. Obviously, you don't have to do it that way since they say you don't have to have read A Visit from the Goon Squad. But my point with that is when A Visit from the Goon Squad came out, it felt cutting edge, very modern. There was a chapter told entirely in PowerPoint. And people were kind of nuts about that. As time has gone on, it's become a little bit divisive. And part of that is when you create something that is of the moment and sort of speculating on where the moment is going, some things will be right, some things will be wrong. Eventually there will be answers and you can end up feeling instantly dated. We've only been 12 years since a visit from the Goon Squad, but there are people who feel like it's too of that time and not of this time anymore. And I think that's part of the critique that people have of that book. We're too close to the candy house right now to know if that's going to happen to this as well, because it does seem like it deals with more resonant topics than a visit from the Goon Squad in certain ways. Obviously, social media currency is something that has really blown up recently and that a lot of people really care about and spend a lot of time thinking about. And that's fascinating to me. I do think Jennifer Egan is someone who is good at creating this sort of sharp critique on or, or just emphasizing uh, like a, per a perspective on something that is very current. But again, it's going to be interesting to see how it holds up as we move away from its publication date. It's a book that is really easy to talk about now, perhaps, but maybe not five years from now, maybe not 10 years from now. And that is definitely, I think, something that has started happening to a visit from the Goon Squad, which is why it seems like it's become a bit of a divisive book over time. And it, we don't know if that will happen to a, the Candy House, but it'll be interesting. I do want to read this book. I confess I mostly want to read it because of its relationship to a visit from the Goon Squad. But I also saw Jennifer Egan speak at the 92nd Street Y when I still lived in New York, and I thought she sounded fascinating. And her perspective on why she created that book and how she created that book, A Visit from the Goon Squad, was fascinating. And I am always interested in what she does, even though I haven't read any of her other books yet. So I'm interested in reading this. And again, the full list will be down below if you'd like to check out more about the title. But uh, I, I'm interested in reading it, and I probably will be reading it next year because I want to do a reread of A Visit from the Goon Squad for my Pulitzer Prize project and see how that goes. The next book is something that I looked at when I was going through the 100 notable list that the New York Times put, pulled together, and I didn't single it out for my video running through, uh, I think, 40 of the books on that list. It's Checkout 19 by Claire Louise Bennett. So I kind of missed this one. Well, I saw it. I just didn't pull it out from the list, so I missed it from that perspective. Here's what they say about it. 
Bennett, a British writer who makes her home in Ireland, first leaped onto the scene with her 2015 debut novel, Pond. Her second book contains all of the firsts, linguistic artistry, and dark wit, but it is even more exhilarating. Check out 19, ostensibly the story of a young woman falling in love with language in a working class town outside London, has an unusual setting, the human mind. A brilliant, surprising, weird, and very funny one. All the words one might use to describe this book, experimental, autofictional, surrealist, fail to convey the sheer pleasure of Checkout 19. You'll come away dazed, delighted, reminded of just how much fun reading can be, eager to share it with people in your lives. It's a love letter to books and an argument for them, too. I think that's a much better description of the book than the blurb that they had in The 100 Notable, because if the blurb in The 100 Notable had been this, I probably would have pulled it to feature in my video where I ran through some of those. That sounds much more interesting. I don't think I'm going to run out and find a copy of this book. I don't even know if I'm really going to back burner it. It does sound interesting, but there are definitely books on this list, particularly on the fiction side, that I would like to get to first, Candy House being one of them. And I think there's a, definitely a world in which I would pick it up, but I'm not really interested enough. I kind of get put off when books really emphasize being experimental and focusing on language. A lot of the time I pick those book up, books up and I'm thinking a lot of like Ali Smith right now and I end up not really responding to them. So I'm feeling very cautious about Checkout 19. If you have read it, leave a comment down below. Let me know what you thought of it. If you think I should reconsider, show your work and let me know. But as it stands right now, I think it sounds like a very interesting book, but probably one that I would not really seek out right now. Then we get to a book that I am currently reading and which I am pretty sure is going to be one of my own favorite reads of the year, Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver. I'm loving this book right now. Let's see what they say about it. Kingsolver's powerful new novel, a close retelling of Charles Dickens's David Copperfield, set in contemporary Appalachia, gallops through issues including childhood poverty, opioid addiction, and rural dispossession, even as its larger focus remains squarely on the question of how an artist's consciousness is formed. Like Dickens, Kingsolver is unblushingly political and works on a sprawling scale, animating her pages with an abundance of charm and the presence of seemingly every creeping thing that has ever crept upon this earth. I think that's a really great description of this book and everything that Kingsolver is doing. She is absolutely political, but not in a pointed way. Like, she's not constantly nudging you about something. She's just reflecting the experience of this protagonist. And by empathizing with him, showing you his plight and how unfair a lot of the things that happen to him are, and how set up for failure he is in so many ways and how devastatingly sad that is. And I am just a, a really big fan. And a lot of that comes down to the empathy that is in this book. I certainly think you can do retellings of books in a lot of different ways, but it's interesting when sometimes they don't really add anything. And I think the fact that she is coming in as politically minded as Charles Dickens was when he wrote David Copperfield, the fact that she is coming in wanting to reflect realities of America, taking a classic tale that people are familiar with and bringing it into the modern world and showing that a lot of those things are still here and making it resonant with people who live in the modern world. I, I love it. I think this is a fantastic book and it's going to be one of my favorite reads of the year. It would have to fall on its face in the last half for me not to include it on my favorite reads of the year, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be very high up there. And I think this is one of two front runners for the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction next year. We'll get to the other one in a moment, trust me. <laughs> and that's not a pun. Although I guess it kind of is, but it was accidental. Yeah, definitely. I think this is one of two front runners for the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. The Pulitzer Prize is difficult to predict. Sometimes being the front runner is a difficult position to be in and I, I do think that the fact that there appear to be two front runners this year for the Pulitzer Prize uh, makes it a really interesting race, but I, I think this is definitely one of the two. 
Let's move on to the next book, which was also on the Washington Post's 10 best books of the year. I'll link my reaction video to that down below. It is The Furrows by Namwali Serpel. After losing her brother when she was 12, one of the narrators of Serpel's second novel keeps coming across men who resemble him as she works through her trauma long into adulthood. She enters an intimate relationship with one of them who's also haunted by his past. This richly layered book explores the nature of grief, how it can stretch or compress time, reshape memories, and make us dream up alternate realities. I don't want to tell you what happened, the narrator says. I want to tell you how it felt. That's a really interesting line to pull from the book. And I think this sounds like an achingly beautiful book. I don't think I can read it right now. If you follow along, you know we, we lost a dog this year, and that's been a process for us. I have been going through a lot of grief over that. So I don't, and I'm not a person who can work their way through something like that by diving into thought pieces about it, novels about it, and things like that. I kind of have to process on my own, and then maybe I can visit other thoughts that will dive in a little deeper. So I am really kind of intrigued by this book. But I absolutely don't think it's something that I would be able to read right now. Maybe six months from now, maybe a year from now. We'll see. I was intrigued by Serpel's previous book, which is called The Old Drift, I believe. And part of me wonders if I would go back and read The Old Drift first. But the more I hear about the furrows, the more it starts to seem like something that I, I might want to not wait for, you know, not hold out to do the old drift first. Maybe I would jump to the furrows. I just need to be in the right mind space for it, and I'm not there right now. So it is what it is. I might get to this at some point, but uh, not now. The final fiction book on the top 10 books of the year, according to the New York Times Book Review, is the other big Pulitzer Prize contender for next year, in my opinion. It's Trust by Hernan Diaz. Here's what they say about it. Diaz uncovers the secrets of an American fortune in the early 20th century, detailing the dizzying rise of a New York financier and the enigmatic talents of his wife. Each of the novel's four parts, which are told from different perspectives, redirects the narrative and upends readers' expectations, while paying tribute to literary titans from Henry James to Jorge Luis Borges. Whose version of events can we trust? Diaz's spotlight on stories behind stories seeks out the dark workings behind capitalism as well as the uncredited figures behind the so-called great men of history. It's an exhilarating pursuit. So I have heard mixed reviews about this book from people. Some people love that sort of fragmented approach to telling the story and the way it kind of upends your expectations, as the New York Times says. There are other people who get really frustrated with it and don't think it quite works or comes together. So... I think this is something that I'm going to need to read for myself at some point and see if it works for me. I am intrigued by the concept, and I think part of why it feels like Demon Copperhead and Trust are far and away becoming the frontrunners for the Pulitzer Prize next year is that they are both inherently American. And the Pulitzer Prize, if you're not familiar, it, the mandate for it is to reward an American author preferably for a work that deals with American life. And these both take very different approaches to that, obviously. Demon Copperhead is taking a British story and making it resonantly American by focusing on rural, rural poverty and Appalachia and opioid abuse. A lot of heavy topics that have plagued this country for a long time and maybe haven't been discussed. And Trust, meanwhile, is really focusing on the financial sector and American fortune. I mean, it's a topic that has been at play in this country as long as this country has existed. If go back 100 years and you would find people talking about American fortune and capitalism just as much. And I, that's one thing that I find really interesting about this because about 100 years ago, the Industrial Revolution had happened and there was a lot of industrialization in the United States and you had oil barons that came out of that and things like that. So it's a topic that has been part of the fabric of America for a long time. And I am someone who is really intrigued by stories behind the stories. So that immediately intrigues me about this book. It'll be interesting to see if the format of it works for me or if, like some other people, I get a little bit frustrated with it. But I definitely want to read it. And they both sound like urgent, topical, but also historical subjects to discuss in American history. 
And I think the fact that they are both the most consistent books that have appeared on best of lists for this year also kind of puts them in the ballpark where they seem like front runners. But it'll be interesting to see what happens. And it feels like in recent years, there's only really been one book that has been a runaway front runner for the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. Last year, I, I would say it was The Love Songs of W.E.B. Du Bois, even though that book ended up not even being a finalist. And I think that just goes to show you can't predict the Pulitzer and also how sometimes being the front runner can kind of work against you, especially if you get a jury for the Pulitzer that likes to find new things and or maybe books that had kind of passed other people by. These books would not fit that bill. I, and actually, I think the last time I can remember there being two far and away front runners for the Pulitzer Prize was when Jennifer Egan won, because A Visit from the Goon Squad was one of the most consistently top tened books of that year, and so was Jonathan Franzen's Freedom. So it really felt like the conversation was coming down to one or both of those. Ultimately, A Visit from the Goon Squad was the only one that was an, a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and it was the one that was chosen. And I'm not gonna get a whole, into that a whole lot, but I just think it's fascinating to see the dynamic that is playing out between these two books and the conversation that they're creating as they both continue to appear on year-end best of lists. And I don't know if I'm going to manage to get to trust before the end of the year, but I do want to get to it soon because I feel like I'm only getting half of that conversation right now since I'm only halfway through Demon Copperhead. It's the only one that I've read on the fiction list and I'm not done with it yet. So definitely more to do and I will hopefully be getting to that one soon. And just to recap really quickly now that we've covered fiction, my prediction list for the, the uh, fiction list was Afterlives by Abdul Razak Gurna. The Books of Jacob by Olga Tokarczyk, translated by Jennifer Croft, Demon Copperhead by Barbara Kingsolver, Net of the Living Res by Morgan Talty, and Trust by Hernan Diaz. So obviously, Demon Copperhead and Trust are the two fiction books that I accurately predicted. I put Net of the Living Res on my prediction list because there's always at least one spot on the New York Times list that goes to a lesser known book, something that kind of comes out of nowhere. And obviously I did not predict it correctly because it went to Check Out 19 by Claire Louise Bennett. That That is the book that I would say fills that surprise kind of out of nowhere spot. I had thought about Lessons in Chemistry. I had thought about The Rabbit Hutch by Tess Gunty. And ultimately I had put Night of the Living Res on my prediction list just because it's a book that I love and would like more people to read. But Check Out 19 took me completely by surprise. Moving into nonfiction. The first nonfiction book on the list is An Immense World by Ed Young, How Animal Senses Reveal the Hidden Realms Around Us. The more I hear about this book, the more it sounds fascinating. I believe Heidi from My Reading Life is a huge fan, and it just sounds fascinating. Here's what they say about it. Young certainly gives himself a formidable task with this book, getting humans to step outside their sensory bubble and consider how non-human animals experience the world. But the enormous difficulty of making sense of senses we do not have is a reminder that each one of us has a purchase on only a sliver of reality. Young is a terrific storyteller, and there are plenty of surprising animal facts to keep this book moving toward its profound conclusion. The breadth of this immense world should make us recognize how small we really are. I think that's a really fascinating approach, and I like books that focus on empathy. Maybe that's, again, why I'm such a big fan of Demon Copperhead as I'm working my way through it. And I, I think it's also important to empathize with animals in the world as well. And so I, I think I'm going to have to find a copy of this on audio because I do nonfiction much better on audio. So I, I, I think I'm going to have to seek this book out because the more people talk about it, the more fascinated I am with what it does and the more I'm kind of interested in reading it. Another book that was on the Washington Post's top 10 of the year is Stay True, a memoir by Hua Su. In this quietly wrenching memoir, Su recalls starting out at Berkeley in the mid-1990s as a watchful music snob, fastidiously curating his tastes and mercilessly judging the tastes of others. Then he met Ken, a Japanese-American frat boy. Their friendship was intense but brief. Less than three years later, Ken would be killed in a carjacking. Sue traces the course of their relationship, one that seemed improbable at first, but eventually became a fixture in his life, a trellis along which both young men could stretch and grow. The way in which people talk about this memoir, it, it does more and more, kind of like an immense world, sound like something that I would like to read. Again, I would probably look for this on audio. I just do better with nonfiction on audio than I do in print. I enjoy reading them in print, but I have an easier time with them on audio, I guess. I don't know. Maybe that's my weird brain. 
But I think the more people, this is very similar to An Immense World. The more people talk about this book, the more interesting it sounds. And the way in the expanded conversation from the live stream, they talk about the dynamic between the two friends and how their friendship started and what it meant over time sounds beautiful. And I'm interested now. They've sold me. <laughs> so I think this is another one I'm going to have to try to look for on audio at some point. I'm not going to rush out and do it, but it does sound interesting. The next nonfiction book is Strangers to Ourselves, Unsettled Minds, and the Stories that Make Us by Rachel Aviv. In this rich and nuanced book, Aviv writes about people in extreme mental distress, beginning with her own experience of being told she had anorexia when she was six years old. That personal history made her especially attuned to how stories can clarify as well as distort what a person is going through. That immediately sounds fascinating to me. This is not an anti-psychiatry book. Aviv is too aware of the specifics of any situation to succumb to anything so sweeping. What she does is hold space for empathy and uncertainty, exploring a multiplicity of stories instead of jumping at the impulse to explain them away. And right there it even mentions empathy, which I was just talking about. So this is definitely a book I was not really familiar with. I know I saw it on the 100 Notable list. And again, maybe it's just that this description of the book is better than the one that was in the 100 Notable. It's The 100 Notable has even shorter blurbs than these. So maybe that's part of it. But this sounds much better to me. And actually listening to them talk about it, it in that expanded conversation in the live stream, again, really made it sound fascinating. So this is actually, again, something that I will probably be seeking out on non, uh, audio and maybe not rushing out to read, but definitely looking for in the future. Now, spoiler alert for my scorecard. The next one is one of the books that I predicted would be on this, and I'm feeling really proud that I managed to pick this one out of the 100 Notable and then add it to my predictions list. I'm feeling very smug about it. It's Under the Skin, The Hidden Toll of Racism on American Lives and the Health of Our Nation by Linda Villarosa. There were a lot of books that talk about systemic racism and the history of racism in the United States on the 100 Notable list, and I had a feeling one of at least one of them would be on the top 10 of the year. And the one that I picked out to be representative of that was this book when I did my video recapping or kind of summarizing some of the books that were on that list. And I felt like this was a good representative of a larger conversation that was happening on the 100 Notable list. It seemed like a wild card to predict for the uh, top 10 list because the focus on healthcare could either throw it out of the conversation, but it's in my mind, it focuses on an area that people don't really think about or talk about as much when they talk about systemic racism, and which is actually an urgent problem in this country. So that's why I had picked it out. And sure enough, that is why they selected it. Here's what they say about it. Through case histories, as well as independent reporting, Villarosa's remarkable third book elegantly traces the effects of the legacy of slavery and the doctrine of anti-blackness that sprang up to philosophically justify it on black health, reproductive, environmental, mental, and more. Beginning with a long personal history of her awakening to these structural inequalities, the journalist repositions various narratives about race and medicine, the soaring black maternal mortality rates, the rise of heart disease and hypertension, the oft-repeated dictum that black people reject psychological therapy as evidence not of black inferiority, but of racism in the healthcare system. I think it just sounds fascinating. And... When I saw it on the 100 Notable list, I had started thinking that it sounded interesting enough that I would probably look for it on audio. Now, hearing them talk about it in the expanded conversation, this expanded blurb about it has kind of convinced me that I would like to read this book. So again, I'm going to be looking for it on audio, probably not by the end of the year, maybe at some point next year. That takes us to the final book on the New York Times Book Review's top 10 books of 2022, We Don't Know Ourselves by Fintan O'Toole. O'Toole, a prolific essayist and critic, calls this inventive narrative, quote, a personal history of modern Ireland, end quote, an ambitious project, but one he pulls off with Elan. Charting six decades of Irish history against his own life, O'Toole manages to both deftly illustrate a country in drastic flux and include a sly, self-deprecating biography that infuses his sociology with humor and pathos. You'll be educated, yes, about increasing secularism, the Celtic tiger, human rights, but you'll also be wildly, uproariously entertained by a gifted raconteur at the height of his powers. And I don't think I even really noticed this one on the 100 Notable list, 
But hearing them talk about it and this blurb about it really convinces me that, it, again, I want to read all of the books on the nonfiction list. And I'm going to have to look for it on audio at some point. The fiction list, I think there's really just that one book, Checkout 19, that I might avoid. But the nonfiction list is solid to me. I want to read all five of them. And I'm probably going to do it on audio. I don't know when I'll get to any of them, <laughs> really, but I would really like to read all five. And one thing that has really interested me, especially since I read The Heart's Invisible Furies by John Boyne, is how drastically Ireland has changed over such a relatively short amount of time. And the fact that this deals with that, and I, I, I love the idea of taking big, sweeping historical changes and making them personal. I love that. I love that. So this book immediately appeals to me. And the fact that it's done with humor just makes it sound even better. So this is another one that I will probably be seeking out on audio at some point. And before we wrap up, I'll just tell you my nonfiction predictions, I got two correct. So overall, I got four out of ten predictions correct. I had thought Breathless, The Scientific Race to Defeat a Deadly Virus by David Quammen would be here. Oddly, both of the books that I felt reasonably certain would be on the nonfiction list are not here. The first one being Breathless, the second one being Constructing a Nervous System by Margot Jefferson. I really thought both of those books would be here but they're not. Oh, well. And then there's An Immense World by Ed Young. I got that one right. Uh, then The Revolutionary Samuel Adams by Stacey Schiff. And Under the Skin, The Hidden Toll of Racism on American Lives and on the Health of Our Nation by Linda Villarosa. So I got Under the Skin and An Immense World correct. I really thought Breathless and Constructing a Nervous System would be on this list. But the fact that they're not, you know, I like that they highlighted some other books as well. So predictions, you get some right, you get some wrong. It is what it is. But anyway, that is the New York Times top 10 books of 2022. I love this list. I hope you are as excited to run through it as I was to run through it this morning after it was announced. And I, I guess the next major literary thing that I'm going to be looking forward to is the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction, which won't be happening until April at the earliest. They've delayed it a couple of times lately because of the pandemic, but hopefully they'll be back on track and April will be uh, my next big literary thing. Obviously, things will be happening in between then and now, but uh, that's those are the two that I just really look forward to with a great anticipation every year. So I hope you enjoyed this as much as I did. I would love to hear your thoughts about this book. I would love to hear what you think should be in here. Obviously, genre bias kind of continues. Sometimes a science fiction book will sneak into the fiction list, but, you know, it is a very literary fiction list this year. You know, it's a, it is a shame that genre books don't get as much of a chance, but I, I do have a hard time arguing with the list that they put out. But let me know what you think in the comment section down below. And as always, I really appreciate your time. I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.